Blake, do you know any words in Japanese? Uh, no, but I can count to four in Korean. Welcome to the Church Gear Podcast, where we pull the tech out of the booth and onto the stage to share the most outlandish stories and hidden wisdom from the tech trenches. And now, here are your hosts. I'm your host, Blake Hodges, a man who picked up a little Korean back in my Taekwondo days, and I'm here with my co-host who speaks very fluent Japanese, Toby Walters. Hi. Hey. <laughs> nope, nope, we're not culture appropriating on this podcast. Let's it's move not, on from that. That's how you say yes in Japanese. Hi. Is, it, Hi. is it really? Yes. Oh, that's cool. That's yes in Japanese. You All ever right. heard of sayonara? Is that Japanese? Yeah, it's goodbye in Japanese. Huh. Ohio is good morning. Now, now I want you to prove to me um, that you can count to four in Korean. Hana, to, set, net, dasit, yasit, if you want to go to five to six. You, so. you just said two for two. Is it like the same word? You said two. It's it's. Duel. Mm, but you pronounce it like a Tennessean. Well, when you learn Korean in Tennessee, <laughs> you don't do it well. <laughs> well. There's very little you do well, Blake. But well, let's see if we can find something, anything on this podcast. So speaking of Japanese, my dad, when I was growing up, my dad, um, he was a third grade teacher, but then he would have summers open. And my mom said, well, you need a job during summer to keep yourself busy because I can't entertain you because my dad's a little like your, hyperactive. Your mom was like, I need to not deal with you in the summer as exactly. well. Exactly. Exactly. Just like the kids. So he got um, connected with a Japanese ex uh, exchange student program and he would host, um, help host Japanese. Um, Foreign high, exchange students? Yeah. High school age. And it, we actually, the, the program partnered with a private girls school. So they were all teenage girls that came over for two weeks in the summer and they would go, go to live at host homes for two weeks and they would learn about American culture. And this was in San Diego. So they would visit, you know, landmarks and different places. And our family became friends with the administration of the school because usually half the administration, the, that sounds so fancy. Well, it wasn't necessarily even the teachers. It was like the headmaster and the principal and, you know, and Japan, they're a lot more formal in their titles. So, oh, you know, I love a, it. I love a good title. It's a private school, so they had they had a headmaster. So one year, and it was I don't know five or ten years after having started working with this school, they would and the Japanese are wonderful gift givers. I don't okay. know if you know this about them culturally. They give very extravagant gifts. I would do bad in Japan. I'm a real bad <laughs> gift giver. <laughs> Tragically, so every year they would come and they would give us a, a gift as a family, like even either individual gifts or a specific um, like family gift. And one year they gave us a family trip to Japan. <laughs> what? Yes. They said, we'd love to have your family come over and spend a couple weeks in Japan. We will take care of everything. And we want you to see the school and meet the students and, you know, experience our culture. And so my parents are like a free vacation essentially. And I have two siblings, so there's five of us. And they said, absolutely. There was only four tickets. They left you, didn't they? They wanted to, but <laughs> little Toby, and I was 10 years old at the time. Little Toby. Coming. So we fly over and we, I'm almost, when I get to the end of the story, you're going to be surprised we didn't fly first class. But we flew over coach and we get there and they pick us up at the airport in two brand new Mercedes. And as we are driving from the airport to our hotel, they explain to us, and very apologetically, and I'm dead serious, they were so apologetic that they realized that their Mercedes, one Mercedes would not fit our entire family, so they bought another one. They bought it? They bought another Mercedes so they could transport our family around during this vacation. And they take us to our hotel, which is in, um, like they have the... Japanese name and then the the U.S. name. The U.S. name is the Imperial Hotel because it is next to and overlooks the Imperial Palace. Okay. And we stayed in the presidential suite. This is ridiculous. I'm waiting for you to say joke at the end of this. Which was 3,500 square feet. Oh my gosh. It's bigger than your house, Blake. Yeah. It's like two of your houses. It's like five of them. They would take us out to lunches and dinners with some of the teachers, some of the administration, and then our family. Um, and again, I'm 10 years old, so I'm getting this information from my dad, like after the fact, and he, like, every day he would be like, yeah, that meal was $600. That meal was $700. And they, um, they also took us two of the days, they took us to this resort right at the base of Mount Fuji. And they had us stay in, um, 
Fuji, that's where they get the, the water, right? Obviously. The Fuji water? Sure. Fiji water. <laughs> Fiji water. Never mind. <laughs> totally different things. So they have, they stay in the suite and we realize later on, they, they explain to us, this is the suite where the prime minister and his family stay. This is ridiculous. This is insane. This doesn't make any sense. And so we were literally treated like royalty. And one of my favorite moments is as we actually toured the school, if you know Japanese, like they all have dark hair. Like there, there are no blonde Japanese people unless they dye their hair. Cultural appropriation. So I am 10 years old and I, at this point in my life, I'm very blonde. I'm a toe-headed kid. So there's a picture of me in, it was in their gymnasium. I think they even might've had a, uh, like a gathering of everybody to, to come meet us. And I feel like my dad spoke and then they translated. Did they think your dad was the president or something? I'm Did serious. Did he do a Bill Clinton impersonation? And they were like, oh. <laughs> uh, it was, this would have been uh, first George Bush. I don't so know. This, this doesn't make sense. And so there was a picture of me at 10 years old, surrounded by a bunch of teenage Japanese girls just trying to touch my hair because they had never seen blonde hair in real life. It was like I was a rock star. It was amazing. Or you were a pet in the zoo that had well, escaped a cage yeah. <laughs> and they could suddenly... My, my dad's nickname for me was the yellow-haired bear growing up. So I am kind of a pet in my family. I'm the youngest and it does fit. Oh my gosh. So well, I just want you to know the expectations I have for when I'm, I'm hosted places and go visit places. I expect to be treated the same way every single time. Well, I, I'd have to say my basement that, I, that we all hung out in for the leadership lunch had to be just as good of a story. Just as, I mean, you mix a mean, a mean drink when you yeah when you can. I mean, we were sitting catty corner to the cat box, so I'm sure that smelled delightful. Yeah, but you were like, Toby, do you want another whiskey sour? And I was like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, introducing a man who seemingly has stored every inch of the world, including, including what we assume all of Japan, even every inch of that hotel that Toby was in, the freelance production manager in front of house mixer, Harold Rubens. Harold, do you buy Toby's story? Because I don't. Man, I, I am so impressed. Uh, that, that was quite a story. That was quite a story. Why, Man. why did they do uh, that? Yeah. It's the Japanese culture. They are a very just uh, friendly. Uh, they're big on hosting and making sure that yeah. like – their own houses and their own lives that they live are much simpler. But when they host guests, they go over the top. That's just their their cultural uh, way of being. But that's yeah. that's incredibly nice. Yes, they are incredibly nice. Huh. Harold, have you been? To I had Japan? a friend of mine said, "I man, I haven't. I have not." Uh, that, I that, beat that, Harold. Sorry to disappoint early. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint early in the podcast, but the, um, uh, but I had a friend that, uh, went out and did a show, did a series of shows out there. And he said, he came back, he goes, I've never had a writer fulfilled to the nth degree. Uh, I mean, every little thing, every cable, every instrument, the exact size, the exact brand, the exact everything, um, and spares and I mean, unbelievable um, how the crews out there worked. And, uh, so yeah, that's very, uh, evident and corroborated about the story that you just told. So, yeah, this yeah. is the, this is the kind of detailed culture I would like to live in. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of, uh, tech directors are thinking, man, maybe I need to, uh, go visit Japan to do some shows over there, get all my writers fulfilled for real. All right. So let's do this five truths and a lie. Let's see if Harold can fool us. Um, number one, once lost the front of house audio console 30 minutes before a stadium show. Just for context, Blake, that's not good. Well, and I, hang on a second. I know it's not good when the Avantis goes flying down a hill. Um, Avantis, that's cute. How do you how do you lose it? I'm guessing it hadn't been set up because these are big things. Like you can't. It would like, it would die like a computer crashes. Oh, okay. So it's not like it got, okay, got it. It didn't get misplaced <laughs> is what I assume. Again, we're trying to, he's, he's not giving us the clues here, but that's what it would typically mean when a front of house engineer says, I lost the console, it crashed. That's why I was confused. I was like, how do you lose it? Yeah. Number two, once dropped a line array speaker column on a person. Was that person's <laughs> name Quentin <laughs> Kelly? <laughs> <laughs> if you dropped it on Q, then we <laughs> already know it's true. Yeah, yeah, I was not involved in that one. Okay. Number three, once saved a presidential speech at the White House. Once saved it? Dang. That, that speech accepted Jesus Christ. <laughs> Number four, I am halfway to an EGOT, Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, Tony. Dang. That doesn't surprise me. Look at his mic. 
This is a this is a man who shows up. He's he's got the business. Number okay, five. Blake, what's a Tony? <laughs> uh, I know what an Oscar and a Grammy and a and an Emmy is. I don't know what a the, Tony's your nickname. It's it's what <laughs> no, my it's phone not. tries to t- make you. <laughs> Tony's an award for uh, like Broadway productions for plays and playwriting and gotcha that kind of stuff. Number five, I started running sound when I was fourteen years old. It seems like a common theme. It's like right around like 12 to 14. Yeah, is I'm not falling for that time. Yeah. That one's just true. Unless he started when he was like eight. Well, that is how he would get us. Six and finally, I once mixed a show with guards with machine guns around wow. me. Wow. Oh, okay. Well, I, I, I think there are a lot of different parts of the world where that would be true. So... Yeah, I'm going to just lock in and say that he did not drop a line array on a person. I mean, to have that happen twice now, because we've already had Q on the podcast and it literally dropped on his face. It should have killed him. Yeah, and he's still such a beautiful man, which I don't understand, but... I, I can't look good normal as, as no. good as Q can with a maybe face Maybe we should line drop array. a line array on your face and maybe it'd fix it. That probably, that's what we should do. <laughs> wow. All right, okay, wow. lock in your life. Uh, I'm going to say that he did not... Oh, these are hard. Come on, Toby. I'm going to say he did not lose the front of house audio console. I'm going to say like it it almost happened, but it didn't didn't actually happen. All right, Harold, we're locked in. What's your lie? What did you say, Blake? Uh, I, Which one was yours? I said you did or not. Or is it together? I said you did not drop a line array on a person. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, um, okay, both of those are true. Ah, what was your lie? <laughs> Uh, the lie is, um, I'm halfway to any got. Are you more or less? I am a less. I, I have an Emmy. I have a Grammy nomination, but, uh, no Oscar, no Tony. So I do have a Grammy on my mom's side and my dad's side. And I do know an Oscar and I do know a Tony, but I don't, don't have any of those awards. So you're saying that you have to win those cause you've been nominated for a Grammy, you said, but that you're not counting that. The Grammy, I was uh, part of a project that was, uh, that ended up uh, receiving Grammy nominations. And so, um, so, the, so yeah, uh, we didn't win that category, uh, but, uh, but I do have a nice little certificate, but, um, uh, an Emmy, I did, uh, win. I was part of a project that was a, a Emmy award winning project. I was a music recording engineer for it. And then, um, uh, not, nothing, not, no Oscars, no Tonys. What was the Emmy project? The Emmy project was, um, uh, is called, it was a documentary called Sam Houston and American Statesman. And what it, what, what it involved, it was a, um, um, uh, so basically it was a, a period piece, uh, the history of Sam Houston. And so basically, um, uh, the director, the producers wanted to have a lot of period music. And so and it not just be canned music. And so we recorded a lot of, uh, a fife band, a lot of penny whistles, uh, marching drums, uh, things that would be playing in the background and, um, things that were playing along. And so, yeah, it was, uh, it was very educational for me, but it was, uh, it was good. And then funny thing about that was that, um, it won and I didn't find out till about three or so years later, um, just happened <laughs> the, 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 yeah, the director, uh, kind of came across on some social thing. I was like, oh, I wonder what he's doing. And I clicked on it and it's, it's his title, so, something said, the description said, uh, uh, Emmy award winning director, whatever. And I was like, oh, what? Do you, I didn't know it because when we had talked, he didn't, you know, so then I clicked on it and I was like, whoa. And I was like, did that thing win an Emmy? So then I started <laughs> looking, I went to the Emmy plays and I started looking it up and I was like, what the heck? Yeah, so where's my award? He goes, oh, and he's like, hey, yeah. He's like, uh, man, yeah, absolutely. Uh, man, contact these people. I'll I'll send in something, and you 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 can you you'll get your plaque or whatever. And I'll talk. so then I contacted them. Sure enough, I there I am listed, and and they sure we were you know just give us an address and we'll send you the plaque. We need to so get a better a, communications director for the Emmys. Yeah. This is stupid because we're still waiting on our Emmy award for the Church Gear podcast. Exactly. Well, and now we there have hope is what yeah. I'm hearing. Yeah. And as dramatic as you are, <laughs> I, I think we qualify <laughs> for a Tony, Blake. I think you can, you know, there's, there's the, um, there's the big uh, uh, televised event that uh, happens, you know, the Emmy awards and stuff like that. And then there's throughout the country, there's a bunch of other events that are recognized that are obviously not a televised show or some big mainstream show or something like that, or some soap opera or whatever. And, you know, and so, 
Uh, but yeah, in there it's, it's official. So, so I do have, I do have a, a an Emmy award, a, a Grammy nom, um, but, and then, uh, no Oscar, no Tony. So that was, that, that was the lie. I mean, that's pretty impressive because Blake has been nominated for nothing. And I have been nominated duly. for glutton of the year. You know, well, yeah, there you go. These days I feel that we can, we can nominate anybody for anything. That's true. Just about glutton you of know, the year. I See? identify I mean, as an EGOT winner. So. Like, <laughs> And I'm looking mean, at your yeah. first two, Harold, uh, these are clearly leading to some disaster stories, which we're going to try and get out of you later in the episode. But I want to jump to this okay. mixed with a show with guards with machine guns. Uh, give us some context there. It was yeah. this in Texas. Okay. It sounds like a Texas deal. No, no, right. <laughs> no, it's not in Texas, but it was right next to Texas. It was in Louisiana. Uh, so, um, and uh, I was with a... Um, uh, uh, so the, the show was a televised event uh, at um, uh, Angola State Penitentiary, which mm-hmm. is the penitentiary for the maximum security penitentiary for the state of Louisiana. And so um, uh, uh, what it was, it was the Broken Tabernacle Choir and Jim Cimbala doing a big ministry event. And this is this is like 98 or 99, somewhere in there. And um, and. What that prison is known for, except uh, uh, other than being, you know, maximum security prison and and, you know, uh, losing up being a no parole state. It's uh, you can imagine that the people that are in there, it's 20 to life, you know, so and you're not getting out, you know. And so the populations, there's inmates. And one of the things that the prison is that prison is known for um, is the prison rodeos. If you know the famous prison rodeos, that's the that's the famous one. And so they have a big uh, prison arena or prison. Yeah, they have an arena, a rodeo arena. And so we were in the infield part of it um, uh, with a small seating area in front of it. And then all the whole audience area was surrounded with uh, fence and, you know, barbed wire and everything. And all around it was guards with machine guns. And I was at front of house, which is right next to the fence. And uh, um, there was guards around me. Uh, and and while we were doing the show, you know, there was that's I'd never had that before. So it was quite a quite a quite a treat to have the, the guard of honor. Um, Blake, I'm waiting for the moment. That I was you very well protected to, to host a live podcast at Angola State Prison with guards with machine guns. Toby, I will be your bodyguard as I'm always the chief of security for you. Um, that's terrifying. Okay, so Harold, it seems like I do, I, I do have there's there's a really neat story attached to that. That um, please, it, man, I tell you, uh, and I don't know if this is a place to tell it, but but it, it's a uh, you know I told you kind of the population that's there, and and um, and there's some prisoners that are called trustees, and they're allowed to you know be within normal population, you know, and, and, um, there was this one, um, so the opening act, I would say for the event was the prison band. They had, they had a band that they had assembled that actually would go and play at other, at other church, at other churches, at other prisons as part of a, you know, uh, it was a really neat thing, but there was a band that they had internal band and they would play. And, and so they were the, they were going to start the, the, the event, and, uh, and this guy was kind of, uh, at front of house, you know, when I was, you know, he was in his jumpsuit and everything and I was there mixing and, and, uh, he, he comes over to me and he's like, you know, the, from the first thing when I just, okay, sound, okay, kick drum, you know, and let me hear the kick drum and it comes over the big speakers and just, you know, hits you in the chest and, and his face is lit up and he's like, whoa, oh my, and he's just really enthusiastic, really excited about everything that we, you know, was doing and the sound and. And he, and I finally just kind of looked, I was like, Hey man, I was like, so do you do sound? And he goes, I, I, I do the sound for the, uh, for the prison band. And I was like, Oh, and so I immediately kind of had a connection with them and I, we started, uh, you know, mixing the thing and, and, uh, man, this guy was so excited to hear his band, uh, you know, I'll say his band, but you know, in that environment playing for, you know, bigger in an arena, you know, and but with big speakers and everything and the energy and just, he was just thrilled. And I just remember I, at one point, um, I, I lean over to the guard and I go, Hey, is it okay if I, is it okay if I let him get on the console? And, you know, and he goes, yeah, it's fine. 
And so I, at the appropriate time when I had everything kind of going and everything going and everything, I kind of looked at him. He looked at me. I go, hey, come over here. And and he, I was like, go ahead. You got it, man. You got it. Here's the vocals. Here's and the, and I, you know, I was right there, but he did it. And I mean, to, the, to this day, I mean, the face, his face, just the, how he lit up, you know, and, and got to do that, you know, and experience that. Uh, it was a gift more probably for me than I could ever have given him. But uh, it was a, it was a really neat story that day, you know, uh, so yeah, that was it, man. That was, uh, it's amazing the places that I've got that, that you get to go and you get to, you know, you get to do, but that was one of them for sure that sticks with you. That is really cool, man, that you set that moment up for him. I, I love when people can realize in a moment how they could give someone else a great moment like that. That's really cool. And I, yeah. it sounds like you've yeah. had a lot of those. I mean, you've been uh, producing or running front of house for every major Christian tour, it seems like for the past 100, 150 years. Um, so how in the world did you get started in the space? How did you become such a fixture in the Christian tour- touring industry? I mean, is there some secret in this? Arge- Ar- oh, I can't say it. Argentinian. Argentinian sauce. <laughs> um, like, I mean, you, uh, you've worked with all the names. You know, my, like, you know, you know, my, you know, my roots, man. Um, uh, well, the secret's not in the Argentinian sauce. I'll, uh, I would like to say that maybe that's the, that's the spice I bring to things, but, um, <laughs> Uh, but I would say, man, um, I got, um, I guess I'll probably, this will give away the, uh, the other truth, but, um, uh, but I would, you know, I, I was, uh, it was around 14 years old where, um, when I kind of got the bug, when I kind of got the, um, um, when things kind of lit up for me in this area, um, and the way it happened, um, before this time, I, you know, the idea of, of, of audio or you know, audio equipment or audio people or, or pe- any, you know, that, that whole world, it wasn't even in my radar. Like it, I just didn't did even, didn't even think about it, you know? Um, uh, and uh, around 14, 14 years old, I went to a, uh, a concert in, in the Astronome, which is the big, it was the big NFL stadium at the time in, in Houston, Texas. And it was Michael Jackson. It was the victory tour. And uh, I remember going to the concert and uh, aside from it being a, you know, phenomenal spectacle, you know, with, with Michael, but the, it, one thing I remember is somewhere in the show, I remember looking down and seeing an island of glowing equipment in the middle of this place. You know, you typically go to a concert and there's front of house and there's a bunch of equipment there. And so it caught my eye and uh, I just, every once in a while, I'll just be glancing down there and, and, um, uh, kind of assessed that, that something that was happening in that area had to do with what was happening on, on the other side of the, 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 the stadium and on the stage. And so after the show, I kind of make my way down to the, the, the booth area to, to look around. And, you know, um, I didn't, I didn't know then who the person was. I know, I know now who the person was that I spoke to, but, um, um, and I can't really tell you, um, some big magical or some big profound thing that he said. The one thing I do know that he didn't do, um, and I will forever continue to do this for uh, when people walk up to the booth or whatever, is that he didn't turn me away. He didn't shoo me away. I was this 14 year old kid, probably wide eyed and wow, you know, what, what, what do you, what do you do here? You know, and, and he took the time to um, answer answer, tell me something. Right. And, and, um, and just that simple act. Um, um, it, I know, I know kind of, when we look at things, sometimes we, we have an action and then there's all these ripple effects. Right. And then, uh, what that transpired to is that, you know, that weekend I go to church, you know, and I go to my youth group, you know, and all of a sudden, oh, there's a soundboard. There is somebody controlling things. There's equipment, there's, you know, this, and you, then then you go to big church, you know, and then you kind of go, Oh, there, they, the, that, that world opened up, you know? Um, and, and so it, that was, that's, that's the earliest I can say, you know, back at 14, 13, 14 years old, where I, that area kind of came into my focus. Um, and and then from there on, it was, gosh, that would have been, so that would have been, 84, 80, I know the tour so, was 84. So, so the height I of been, Michael Jackson's fame, like he's the biggest artist in the world. 
And that moment just clicked with your, well, the, your heart and your soul. The victory tour would have been like yeah. the victory tour would have been the the thriller record. Okay. Um, it yeah. was the first time Michael did by himself when he was not the Jackson five and, you know, so that was the, you know, so. So you, you take know, that experience um, and then you're, you're at church and it's, you know, you're suddenly realizing, oh, there's, there's production at church. But, you know, back in mid eighties, production was very different as far as the, the equipment and the things that were being done. Um, did, was it just sound at that point, basically just running audio? Uh, no, I mean, for me, you're saying, you're asking the question just for the, me, like what awoke in me. Was, was there any video or lighting back oh, then or was it basically there was you very, sound guys? Yeah, it was very different. Like there was church and then there was concerts, you know, and, um, uh, this, the, today those lines are kind of blurred a little bit. Now, it, not so much in the, in the place but a lot of churches are concert venues and and then a lot of churches actually have better gear than what's out on tours you know and and a lot of church gear is used when tours come through so like um but that wasn't the case back then you know yeah church was you know big pulpits and you know and and piano orchestra choir you know maybe a pipe organ you know i mean you you think of your traditional first second baptist church you know and in churches and 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 that's kind of what it was you know and so um, so, but, um, coming back from, from, uh, from, uh, the concert and coming back to church, it was like, all of a sudden I was like, oh, there's some, there is a person that's making a decision or making adjustments for how it sounds. There's a person that is making an adjustment for how the lights come on. So maybe we didn't have moving fixtures and maybe we didn't have, you know, video cameras everywhere and screens everywhere and stuff like that. But and maybe we didn't have, you know, um, I mean, we had big boards back then. They were just a whole lot bigger because there weren't mm -hmm. digital boards. <laughs> they were huge. You know? Yeah. But but the uh, um, but. Uh, the concept of somebody actually being able to uh, to make an adjustment and making a decision for the mass for the mm -hmm. congregation, you know, to that that concept and and that drew me. And so when I got drawn to it, you know, my first step was asking my youth leader, "Hey, who, what what is who does this?" Oh, that you know, and he pointed out a person, and I went and talked to him, and and that person was also kind of inviting. It's like, oh yeah, you can, you know, I'll, I'll stand here, watch, you know, and. And quickly that kind of became a thing to where like I realized that it made sense to me, like the ins and outs, you know, like I'm not saying I'm not going to say that I instantly knew everything about sound. I still mm -hmm. don't, you know, that's just far from it. The point being that I like it, I grasped it pretty early. And so and um, what was and, your and because it was a youth service? Uh, what was your first like either? Was it a large church that you got? uh on staff at, or was it a first tour that really was like, you know, after you learned a lot about it and what, what was your first big moment as a, as a producer or a front of house engineer? Yeah. So, uh, I would say that, um, uh, back when, uh, well, big moment, gosh, um, it, I would say, it, uh, one thing that, that, uh, part of, uh, so, when I graduated high school and even in high school, I was doing, you know, I was always, I was the guy that figured out the school sound system. And so then they would say, Hey, can you help us do our choir concerts? Can you help us do our band concerts? Can you help us do our talent shows and those kind of things? And then that, so I kind of knew that this is the direction I was heading into. Well, back then there wasn't full sale or at least full sale wasn't what it is now, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, a conservatory, all these schools, all these big schools that have names now and big programs weren't that back in 1990 when I graduated high school, you know? And so, um, I did find a, um, a school in town, um, uh, the Art Institute of Houston, and that had a video business, a video music business program studios. And I went there, graduated, you know, and part of the graduation there was to, you had to intern, uh, in a field. And, uh, that's where I got involved in the, in the recording studio. Um, I had a connection to a recording studio, uh, and it was the age old story of that. Everybody says, you know, I was sitting there taking notes and phone messages. And one day the guy says, Hey, could you come in here and, and, and show me this, show me that, see if you know how to do this. And, and I did. And, uh, and then he's like, man, okay, well you can come in at night and practice. And here I am, it was a, a, a kind of a known studio, popular studio in Houston that did a lot of big records. And, and I got to come in at night and 
practice, you know, and then that kind of led to um, uh, around town and being in a big city like Houston is, you know, started to work at a club and started to work. And then at church, uh, one, one, one great thing at the church is it was, it was a big, bigger Baptist church. And um, they, if you remember back then, there was these things called artist in residence. Mm -hmm. um, I don't sure. know if you know what that is, but. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, I was and one. And <laughs> back then, were you really? Okay, oh, yes. that's awesome. So, so back then, the artist, this is in the, you know, in late 80s and 90s, there was an artist, his name is Wayne, Wayne Watson. Yeah, I remember. And he, uh, yeah, phenomenal guitar player, phenomenal vocals, uh, great music. And and he was the artist in the residence there. Well, the good thing about uh, having somebody like that is that every time he would ask to for you to help him or do something, right, whether it be run tracks or he would just perform at the church or something like that, is that that person had a higher standard, right, mm -hmm. than what church was. And so when you would, so one great thing about Wayne was that, man, he could just call out frequencies. And so when he would say, hey, could you reach that EQ and pull down some 400? I did, and it got better. And, mm -hmm. I, and so I started making these associations. And, and so doing that, the, the thing about the church was that it was a big church. So we would do these big pageants and we had have a big orchestra and big choir. And we, everything was big. Everything's bigger in Texas, right? So um, <laughs> anything that you had to do was, yeah. So everything we had to do was bigger. And I, here I am as this 18-year-old, 19-year-old kid in the middle of that trying to, how do you do these big choirs? How do you do these orchestras? You know, and there was a guy that I was kind of mentored me. And, you know, I, at the time, you know, or he knew more than I did, you know, obviously I was a young kid. Um, and, uh, but he was a very dedicated person to the church and, and, and did sound. And so I learned from him and, and, and you know, and then I picked up ways to do things and that just kind of, it was one step in front of the other, you know, then I, um, I, because of the school, I met a person that worked at a radio station. And then I spent, I had a stint in major market radio, which was a whole nother world. So I worked in, you know, uh, like a radio station in a major city. Um, and productions for that kind of deal was a whole different world. You know, I DJed in clubs for a long time. Uh, all the while working in studio and doing live sound here at, at clubs and different places. So I had a, like a big, I was quickly in that, in those very young age, like by before I was like 20, 21, 22 years old, maybe around that time, I was exposed to a lot of studio, live radio station, choir or churches and orchestras. And, um, um, and so I was exposed to a lot, um, and then I would say that um, through a series of, man, I would say different connections, um, I get a phone call um, uh, with this guy and he says, hey, can you come in? I'd love to interview you um, and uh, I want you to be my my second engineer, you know, my assistant engineer. Today we would say probably you're the A2 or something like that of and the, the place was at Second Baptist Houston, which is a oh, yeah. large church. Yeah, in Houston, Ed Young's Texas. church. Um, Ed Young's, yeah. So um, at the time, um, I would say at the time, it's probably safe to say that it was probably, the, the well, the, the auditorium itself. Toby, have you been in the, did you, have you been there? I have not. Been to the auditorium? I know we've, we've chatted with them several times. Okay. I've never actually been yeah. in the auditorium. Yeah. Great, great, great people there. So the auditorium, now it's got seats, but it used to have pews. And when it was pews, the seat count, I mean, it was 6,000 seats, probably. Yeah. It has double, double balconies. It's humongous. And then, um, so you walk in there and all of a sudden, um, I ended up getting a job at Second Baptist as the second uh, engineer. And, mm -hmm. and again, the level of equipment was this, you know, not your, it wasn't your beginner. It was, you know, an Amic recall RN con, uh, yeah, console, that's a, big, that's a serious big large format. Yeah. Mic microphones, tons of inputs. Uh, the PA was, uh, they had just installed a brand new uh, Apogee sound sound system, which was, mm -hmm. you know, kind of state of the art at the time. You're kind of the leading in, 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 in different areas. And so I was exposed again, one of those other things, I just got exposed to a lot of things yeah. early, early on six months into this job. Um, I guess I'm now, I'm probably, I'm 23, maybe 24 years old, six months into this job, the guy that hired me says, Hey, um, 
just want to let you know I'm, I'm going to go. Uh, I'm I'm going to go put in my resignation. You know, I'll give some time, but I'm going to I'm going to be leaving for another for another thing. And you know, three or four months, two months later, I think he was gone, and here I am at 24 years old. Um, Running the, the ships <laughs> in charge of of running the ship of probably yeah. one of the largest churches in America at the time, you know, and not yeah, only I mean, the size of the building, but the uh, congregation too. And you know. we've heard this story, like such a similar story over and over recently where, you know, 22 year olds come in and all of a sudden, six months later, a year later, they are running the show of a 4,000 seat auditorium, a 5,000 seat auditorium. So Harold, yeah. you're young, you're, um, you're the you know, the head engineer for Second Baptist in Houston and one of the biggest churches in the country. And then, you know, fast forward in your career, you've been out on the road with Stephen Curtis Chapman, Crowder, United, like all these names. You know, what I'm, what I want to learn from you is how did your approach in church then translate to touring? And then how do you bring, you know, how do you translate between the two? And how can, you know, a lot of our audience is church tech directors and they're mixing in churches and mm -hmm. they're trying to get some of that vibe that Elevation and Hillsong and all those people are creating out on yeah. the road. And so what are some of the things that you've learned out on the road that you can then translate back into church to to help create just m memorable worship experiences? Yeah, yeah. Great, great question. And real quick, just uh, you mentioned United. I, I never mixed for United. It was a it, I think you're referring to maybe an event that was called CCM United, okay. um, which was a, a big like 40 artist event that I had to mix for. And it was crazy. But that's right. But just to be clear, just a, um, uh, I never mixed for Hillsong United or anything like that. But the uh, um, so, yeah, um, well, uh and I don't, I don't have to go far from where I left off with the going to, because in the church of Second Baptist, there was a band that was forming and a band that had come up and it was the college and youth band kind of deal at the time. That band that formed, um, we were all friends and it was a band called Cademan's Call oh, sure. um, that was in that church. And so, and man, we all were in that church together and they blew it out of the gate with their music and their first record just national record blew up mm -hmm. and a bunch of number ones and, and they went on the tour and they, and they kind of, you know, um, and so I was a buddy and I was at the church and, and so quickly we be, we, in the same way that I kind of fell, not fell into, but kind of, you know, got these other jobs and then stayed at with Cadmus, it was like, Hey, can you come help us do this week and run? Can you help us with this? Can you know this? And, and I would go do shows with them and we were all figuring it out. I mean, we, we did the van tours, we did all these things, but, um, but to kind of fast forward a little bit, when you mentioned like going back and forth between church and, and, um, and touring, um, man, I, I think a lot of the skill sets are, are the same as far as when you get down to the technical side of things, like maybe, you know, uh, controlling the console, you know, and setting up things and maybe dialing things and, and, and effects that we use or methods that we use to do that. I think where some of the differences are, um, is that in, um, in church world, um, it, there's, there's, a, let me, let me rephrase that in touring world, there's, there's variables that are way beyond your control. Um, that happened. And, and it's day to day, like, you know, you're in a different room, you're in a, with sometimes the different PA, sometimes with different gear. Um, so a lot of things that are way beyond your control that really affect the, really affect the, the evening, um, aren't in your control. And so, but you have to deal with it, you know? And so, and you have to deal with it within, you have to figure that out within a few hours, you know, um, in church, you know, every room has a sonic sig signature and then, and then every room has their challenges and, and every, in every performance you're going to have, you have to deal with, well, this drummer plays this loud in this room or this drummer, you know, we get a little bit of bleed or, you know, the age old questions, you know, that everybody has. And then, and then like, or maybe the PA sounds a certain way or there, or the, the room resonates at this. Well, over time you deal with that and you get it dialed in, you know? And so then that environment doesn't change 
frequently once you get a you know it, your your stage setup might change your band might change and that kind of stuff but the room is the room and and, and do you so have I think any, that since you've been on the road so much do you have any favorite venues or rooms that you mix in that just stick out in your mind like oh that was an ultimate oh, gosh. experience or gosh that room sounded amazing or that PA was over the top man i I don't get too caught up in, in saying that, 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 that a room sounds amazing. If I can get the show to where I want it to feel, then I feel like that night I succeeded, right? Um, um, but as far as rooms that I've been in that I kind of say, wow, I, that I pinch myself in or that I would – the Ryman Auditorium, for example, in 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 in, um, yeah. in Nashville is is one that I still. I mean, I've been in it. I've been doing shows in it now for thirteen years, maybe fourteen years, and and still every day I I you know I, I walk in I, I when I walk into it I I'm still in that same the same feelings come up because it's the legendary venue and it's um um and so much of the history that's there. Another one would be that it, you know I've gotten to take shows into Carnegie Hall. Oh, uh, wow. And that's, that's, that's a, cool. a magical space, you know, uh, any specific uh, Kennedy Center that, in Washington, any specific churches that stick out in your mind of like, that's a great church to mix in. That room just is something special. Hmm. Um, well, I would say I would have to, I would have to qualify that in, in whether I brought a PA in or not, you know, but I would say, um, I remember, you know, <laughs> your, our buddy uh, that we mentioned, um, uh, Dave Rodiger, you know, when he was over at uh, at, at um, Bayside Bayside in Sacramento. I remember uh, one of the first times I, I got in there um, and I remember just walking in and kind of, you know, that gave, I think, Lee, well, Lee was there, yeah, for sure. And, you know, gave him the lines and, and then turned on the PA and I was like, and I looked at my you know, smart rig and all this. And I was like, man, I really don't have to do much to this. You know, it was pretty dialed in. And, and so, you know, like I said, I, there's, there's rooms that you walk into and like you turn on and then you have a sonic mind print of, of where you want the night to be. And so if you're starting way off from that, then, you know, you're gonna have to do a lot of work, but if you're, you're starting off and your reference tracks are sounding great and, and it's just a little tweak here and there, and then you're going to be that much better. And, you know, um, I have this kind of thing that I, I like to, I like to mix as opposed to how I like to, you know, then, then having to fix things, you know? And so, um, I think when we get to those places where the room works great, the PA that's, in, it's installed well and sounds good and it's tuned well and, and all these things working, then the, the experience becomes greater. You know, it's all, it's all some of the parts, right? All yeah. these little things. And so, um, when, when all that lines up, then, then it makes for a really pleasurable night for both the artist, the audience and yourself as a, as an engineer, you know? So let's talk about the moments when it doesn't go right. When I, all the, yeah, these two disaster stories that have been hanging on from the, the five truths and a lie. Yeah. The tension is looming too much. I got to <laughs> pop it. Tell me, tell me the disaster stories. Man. Okay. The line array fell um, on somebody. What'd you do, Harold? Oh gosh. So I would say this, you know, you know that, um, you know, when you, I don't know if you have in the shop there, you have a ladder, right? And if you look on the side of the ladder, there's this long strip of things that you should not do on the ladder. Like all these warnings. Frank right? could tell you those by and you kind of go. I think we're going to find out like, you that know, he actually wasn't mixing in the, like he was mixing in the prison <laughs> because he'd been put in prison for killing someone. Yeah, yeah. There's a reason, there was a reason I was in prison. Oh, the, um, uh, but yeah, I, I think that, um, so this would have been, I think, 99, 2000, I think it would have been 2000. And so line arrays hadn't been out. Uh, they were, they've been out, but they're just one as popular as they are now. I mean, there was a few manufacturers that had line arrays. And, um, and so, and even so there weren't like, you know, very, very attainable. I mean, you could get them, but anyway, so, but on, I was out on a, on a tour with Cadence Call and we had a, we had a Martin line array, uh, W8 LMs, I think. So not, 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 not a huge box, but you know, two eights. And, uh, and I think I had eight hanging, uh, and it was on lifts. And, um, the way that, that, that one particular line array, uh, hangs is from a single point from where the harness is, uh, there's a single point. And so what you have to do when you have to hang it off of a lift with, with, uh, forks is you have to use two shackles to turn one, and then you run the, the, the span set through it and to lift it up. 
And so um, I hung one side up, stage left was great, go to stage right, and the PA kept turning on me, kept turning on me. I couldn't get it to center. And then I found out that the, you know, I look up and and the shackle was turned. And so I was like, man, okay, I gotta, I gotta get up there and I gotta turn the shackle, you know, uh, for it to sit right. And I'm like, man, I was, it's one of those moments where I'm like, man, I do not want to, because I was on a lift, you know, the only way I couldn't bring the PA down enough that I had to, um, I had to take apart, take apart the whole line array to get to, you know, be able to do this and take the weight off. And so I had this stupid idea of, hey, I'll land the PA, take the weight off and quickly turn the shackle, which requires unbuckling it and, you know, and then turning it and putting it back. The thing was that I even practiced it. I grabbed the span, said I put a shackle, put the other shackle on it and see how long it would actually take me to do it. And I was like, oh, I can do this. It's no big deal. So I get up there, I bring the PA down, put the PA on the floor, take the weight off the span set. And, uh, and I know every, every tech director, every production person right now, uh, my friends that, that may listen to this stuff are going, no, you didn't. And I was, and yes, I did. Um, and um, Blake would have uh, too. It's fine. But this well, is why. It's, it's Toby's this is why. Is happening right now. Hope, hopefully, hopefully, you know, people are going. You know, they're like, see, that's that's why you don't do it. And I will save. I will save somebody. Uh, but the thing was that I, uh, I said okay, and I I got somebody. Uh, I got this kid, you know, and I said, hey, listen. Um, when I landed the PA, you know, it was kind of balanced. And so I could, I could literally move it myself. And so I was like, Hey, can you just put your hands on this and just put a little bit of weight on it? Don't push it, but just put your weight. I'm quickly going to release this and, and put and hook it back up. And he's like, sure. And so I was like, okay, everybody ready? Okay, here we go. And I released it. And wouldn't you know that at that very second, somebody in the room goes, Hey, Harold. And so I turned my head. Mm. And when I get back, the PA wasn't there. <laughs> you know, oh, it was like it was man. going. And I was like, and uh, and man, I mean, in a split second, this PA, so you can imagine, was on the floor and it starts, you know, falling over. And this kid is there and this PA falls all the way to the ground, makes all this noise, chairs go flying and all this stuff. And from where I'm at, I'm looking down and all I see is basically two hands and two legs. And this oh is gosh. PA on top of this person. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was it was solid in the room. I jumped probably the 10 feet or 12 feet from the top of the lift all the way to the ground and got there and quickly went to the ground. And I kid you not. I dive to the ground, to see what this person is, and I'm just ready for anything. And I look at this kid and he goes, he looks at me and he goes, whoa. <laughs> that was, that's what he said. He just kind of said, whoa. And I'm like, all right, don't move. Okay. Um, or what, what hurts? What are you? Is everything, or, you know, like I'm trying, I'm first of all, I'm glad that he spoke. Right. And then I'm like, okay, what's, you know, where, where's the PA on you? And he's like, man, I, I, I think I'm fine. And he kind of shimmies out from underneath the PA and the PA, I mean, had fallen and literally had land at the top, the, 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 the top thing had landed on a chair, which didn't give because it broke other chairs. And that kept it about a foot and a half from actually falling all the way wow. to the ground. And that's where this guy, that little cavity is where this guy was. And the Lord saved him and, with that uh, chair. Dude. I mean, I mean, I, I was not the same, uh, that rest of the day, the rest, of, I mean, from now, I mean, I, even now that I think about that, I mean, how yeah. quickly, uh, a stupid decision or a, you know, um, uh, just something that you kind of go, I think it's just a lesson. I mean, for me, I mean, you know, I mean, I, uh, how quickly something, why you go, okay, why you do safety harnesses, why you do your safeties on lights, why you do, you know, you double check things because I mean, that's, I practiced it and I was like, oh, it's going to be really quick. And then all of a sudden somebody called my name and that was that second of distraction. And that's all it took for me to keep, take my eye off of it. And, and it could have changed somebody's life, you know? And so, um, yeah. Okay, so anyway, so then, uh, that's amazing. Go ahead. How about yeah. that front of house console that went down 30 minutes before a stadium show? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Losing the console meant that I, that the console like died. Um, uh, and what I knew console exactly was it? Where the front of house console. It was a big analog console. Uh, it was a large frame Midas heritage 2000 H 2000. Okay. Um, 
and uh, a, a rack, a couple of racks of analog gear. And the show was um, a stadium show in uh, Bermuda, Hamilton, Bermuda, for the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. And so, ton of inputs, uh, a full band in the choir. Now, when I say the choir, the choir is like 300 people, right? And wow. so that's like some um, small churches and attendance right there. It's uh, it was it's huge. Well, anytime you do anything with uh, the Broken Tabernacle uh, Choir, um, they are it, it's a ton of moving people. You know, moving people everywhere, and and then with that comes a lot of gear and a lot of a lot of everything. Right, big stage, big. You have to to fit all that. Um, I was the production manager and also the um, front of house guy for that show, and I, I said that we were in Hamilton, Bermuda. The reason I say that is because uh, there's not gear down the street or a shop down yeah. the street or a church churchgear.com down the street that you can just call up and go, Hey, could you have this? No, we literally had containered everything from the United States uh, wow. to pull the show off th that size uh, stages and everything. And, and so what had happened was that um, uh, we had set up the PA day, the, the couple of days before we tuned it, you know, we did sound checks with the band, brought the choir over the choir. We did a sound check. Everything was sounding great. Um, we all, you know, we're ready for show, you know, start playing some playback music and then we all go to backstage. And the thing to, to know about um, doing shows in island country, especially outdoors, is that usually about 5, 6 p.m., somewhere in there, coastal, any coastal storm. town is that usually there is a little, little quick squab that go, comes in, you know, comes, comes through and, 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 uh, and then you're like, and that's it. It's just a quick, probably 30 minute, maybe something a little quick, little downpour, and then it's over, you know, and it clears up. And we were ready for it. I mean, the production company that we hired, the vendor, you know, they were ready for it. And so they had the tarps, they had all the stuff and, you know, we were all ready for this thing. And so we, we purposely finished sound check in order for to cover everything up and do all that. Well, we um, go to a uh, catering, we're backstage, you know, the show wasn't going to start to, you know, for a few hours, whatever. Well, then like 30, 45 minutes or so before the show, I get this uh, tap on the shoulder. It's like, hey, do you, are you hearing what's happened with the sound? The noise is coming out of the PA. And I'm sorry, I walk out to the front and sure enough, there was this, you know, it sounded like a loose cable, like so, mm -hmm. something shorting out. And uh, so I make my way to front of house and lift up the tarps. Um, and sure enough, when I, uh, every time the noise would happen, all the LEDs would just light up, would just be lighting up call the system tech over, call the production people over and they, we quick, we power down the console. Anyways, we still don't know how, what we think is, or at least what they think is that rain from the spot towers up above, we were up on this big uh, deck and there were spot towers above that rain came down, wasn't directly hitting where the console was, but because there was a series of tarps that it worked its way in and finally into the console because when they, that console is a modular console, so you can take and put strips out. When we took stuff out, there was probably, they said, a half inch to an inch of water wow. uh, in the console. And so, um, so long story short was that they ended up, um, we, we got to a point where we, we did a bunch of troubleshooting and, and, and time was running out. The, the show was about to start. And I remember that we had in the truck a Mackie. SR24.4, oh, no. SR24.4. I don't even know if you guys have any of that Not stuff. Anymore. You, if, you nope. know, No, but um, it's a little, it's got 20 inputs and a couple of stereo channels. Um, I dropped a 24.8 or something like that yeah, in the bathroom did. once. Yep. yep. Back at the barn. Uh, and, and, uh, and I remember there was one in the trailer and we had it because we had, we, the, 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 the choir was doing some ministry events throughout town before, and so we just needed a little, I guess back in the nine, you know, year 90 something, whatever, that's all we had. So it's all analog. And so we, um, I was like, Hey, go get that board. Because my thought was, Hey, at least I can put the opening act on, which was a couple of handhelds and tracks. And at least we'll get that going. It'll buy me 30 minutes right until we figure this out. And, um, so we brought it over and we started moving lines over and then, we, uh, I remember somebody had run over to across where the stadium was, across the plaza where the stadium was. There was like a kind of like a Walgreens or a CVS type store where, you know, and they found hair dryers there. So they, <laughs> so all of a sudden, like five hair dryers show up at, um, at front of house and, uh, and they're taking, they're sorry, they're taking, um, 
uh, modules out and drying them with tiles and then, and then air drying them and inside the console drying everything. Up. Well, we get the console powered back up. And um, the only thing that we could, we thought we'd, well, this will just work, right? No. And so the only thing that actually ended up working was the left side of the console out of the insert sends of the subgroup. Oh my That's gosh. the only output I could wow. get out of the console. Only the left side, which just happened to be where the band inputs were. So I took those channels into the Mackie. I took the choir and the soloist into the Mackie. I took one reverb unit into the Mackie. No, I mean, I had a rack full of lexicons and yeah. all kinds of gates and no, can't use any of that stuff. And literally did a whole stadium show on a Mackie with a Midas sitting right in front of it. Like the Mackie was on top of the Midas. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, and, and uh, mixing everything off of a uh, Mac. And it, you know what, here's the deal. That nobody in the crowd knew, right? It was fine. And it, it was an incredible night because the choir got to sing. I mean, we only started the show maybe 30 minutes, the 30 minutes late. Mm -hmm. um, we did all that. And it was in a great, a great response at the end of the night because it was there was some ministry happening, there was some teaching happening. And so a big turnout, the stadium was full, and and it was a great night. And I think at the end of the day, we all kind of went like that's the bigger story, you know, like we can get wrapped up in all that stuff. But I think that's probably um, uh, when you look at these things, there's always a bigger story being told at each one of these events. And we can get, be it, we can get, you know, we can get easily, we're really good at getting mm. sucked into how good the snare drum sounds and lose the sight of the big picture, you know? Yeah. Keeping the big picture uh, in mind is really important, especially keeping us level in those, yeah. in those moments. Um well, Harold, yeah. uh, we'd love to wrap all our episodes on a tech takeaway, something that you would tell if there was a, you know, a sea of tech directors right in front of you that would make their Sundays better. Yeah. Carry a couple extra hair dryers, apparently. Yeah, apparently that's one of them. <laughs> um, but no, it could be philosophical, relational, any of the, any of the ools. Uh, what, yeah. what would you say uh, as a tech takeaway for our, our, our tech directors? Yeah, man, I, I, I think I can sum up a lot of um, uh, everything that, you know, we can plan to talk about and stories and all this stuff. And I, I think when, when I look back at everything I've, I've done and, you know, and, and I'm still kind of every single day is a common practice. I think for me, I'm, I'm pretty short sighted and I have to kind of look back to remember where I am and where I'm going. Right. Like I'm, it's kind of like the way I find myself and find center myself and, and then, you know, form a path. But, um, but I think that um, I would, I would say to answer your question, and I think you you just said it. You just nailed it. It's always keeping. It's always keeping um, having a real clear clear picture of what the what the big picture is, what the story is, and that 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 there's a lot in that answer. Like because if you're a tech director, um, you need to have that clear picture because you got to communicate that to the rest of your team because your te the rest of your team is tasked with audio and that can be very specific and we can break that down there's the guy that makes us front of house the guy that makes us monitors the guy that makes us broadcast uh the stage manager a lot of guys in the audio team right and then there's like the worship leaders and they have their area which is music and then they have the lighting people and the and the video people and everybody has their little niche and their routes and their their lanes that they need to operate in um but you as a tech director i think you have to you yourself have to have a clear um, understanding of what the bigger picture is. Um, so you, and you need to communicate that. And I would, and I would say that, you know, that that's something that's free and that's something that doesn't cost anything and doesn't, but it's, 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 it's forever changing in everything that, that you do. Um, I, I, I kind of use this kind of metaphor, but uh, Toby, okay. Your company here, church gear, you guys have a shipping department, mm -hmm. right? And you, you're shipping gear probably daily. Yep. Right. Absolutely. And let's say that you will, yeah. Okay. And you walk in and you say, Hey guys, can you get this package out? And, 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 and the guys will, you know, you're the boss and you walk in, they'll check the label and they'll go, okay, great. This package will go out with the, with the packages later on. Right now, let's say you walk and you're like, Hey guys, um, this package, um, it's really important. I really needed to get out today. Can you make sure that it gets out today? It's kind of important. And so now that worker is going to grab that package and it's going to look at the link. He's going to, he's going to see the urgency in your voice and he's going to go, hey, um, yeah, let me check it. OK, I need to make sure this goes out today. Might put it at the top of the pile. And he's going to do that. Right. And he's going to do that work. Now, 
let's say, Toby, you walk in and you say, you know, let's say you walk in and you go, guys, I really, this is packed. We did it. We did it. We got to get this package out. And let's just say, maybe it's not church gear, but in, in another organization, you go, I have the cure to cancer right here. Mm-hmm. I need to get this out today. Yeah. All of a sudden that worker goes, oh my gosh, like I got, and he's going to check that label. He might actually drive it to the UPS store or put it on the FedEx guy. And he might actually say to the FedEx driver, hey, this is, re- this is really, you got to really protect this, right? Guess what? You never asked them to do anything different. He basically took a package. He basically did his job and he fulfilled it, right? He did his job. The thing about it now is he's got a whole different understanding of how important this job yeah, is. He understands the purpose. But he's not doing anything different. It's just exactly, there's a bigger purpose. So I think that as we approach running sound, we need to be diligent and we need to train ourselves and we need to have our teams ready to faithfully do those responsibilities and do them good so that we're not in the way of anything that might be happening in the room, right? Um, yeah. But at the same time, you always need to have that bigger because patching the stage with a higher purpose now translates completely different. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, and so running lights, you know, saying, Hey, I'm going to point people to look this way because over here there's this message happening, right? Videos. Like I want to make sure that what I have on the background doesn't take, doesn't, doesn't, you know, take away from what's happening in the foreground. Yeah. And I want to make sure when you're running video, you're like, man, I am the eyes to somebody you know, that experience that somebody's having in their living room couch because they either chose to be at home or they can't make it to church. You are the one that's trans- providing that experience to them. And we can worry about what lens we're, we're working on, what cameras we have, whether it's a red camera or this or w- what switchers we have, carbonites or black mat, whatever. We can worry about all that stuff and we need to. That's all important, right? But I think we all need to be really, really mindful of what the higher, the higher purpose is and the higher story is. And, and that doesn't just reside in church, you know, and a tour is the same thing. You know, I think we all need to be mindful of that. And, um, yeah, keeping the- but yeah, I, I, th- I think that's, that would be the tech talk, you know, and we're, I think we're really, really good at tech talks. Like we're really, really good at dude, what plugin are you using? Yeah. What console, what's your favorite compressor? What's camera lens? What lighting are you, what, what's your favorite console manufacturer? Like we can get into all that stuff and we're really good at staying there. Right. But like, um, I love, we, we have, we have some mutual friends and you guys know Jeff Sandstrom, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. And he would, he would, he would tell the story that I love the way he phrases it, that he said that, um, you know, that he would be at, a running mixing for for uh tomlin and and you know and everywhere you look and this can be anywhere or passion commerce at, at your local church everywhere there's going to be people that are you know they're 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 in the seats and they're just hands across you know and they're just uh, whatever they got dragged there right and i remember jeff saying something was like what do i need to do tonight for that guy to experience what's happening tonight mm. to for that experience to change his life tonight maybe you know like dude you are and you, we can look at it and go, dude, you just run sound. You're just a mixer, you know, like, yeah, but we, we have a part in that story and what's happening in that night. And we have a responsibility. And so um, I think that's the, I love how Jeff phrases that and that he actually ha- is going to take, puts himself in the line of fire of saying, I'm going to take an active role in that guy's experience tonight. Yeah, that's- that maybe he's going to let his arms down and let something in and experience. And that might even be a life-changing experience. Yeah, so, that's great. You know? Yeah, focusing on the the why instead of the what. Yeah. Um, well, Harold, man, we really appreciate you coming on and all the all the stories, and I'm just glad that uh, no one died in any of them. Um, <laughs> is there anything you wanted to? No, no, is there anything no you wanted death. to plug or point people to after this episode for them to find you at? Uh, man, uh, at Harold Rubens, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, I'm, never, I'm never on Twitter, but uh, uh, Instagram, uh, Facebook. Uh, yeah, cool. That's that's where that and and uh, DM me or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm an open book and and I love I love coming alongside people and imparting experiences and 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 sharing stories. Yeah, love it. Sweet. I'll link those. Um, well, man, thanks for coming on. Absolutely, absolutely. It's an honor. Thank you, guys. Thanks for hanging out with us. We hope to see you back next week for more absurd stories, tech takeaways, and overall buffoonery here at the Church Gear Studios. Blake, I feel like, uh, you know, he said, come alongside people. And so obviously he even said, 
prisoners. So I feel like even you, Blake, could learn something from Harold if you found him online. Toby, they wouldn't let me in prison. <laughs> <laughs> They'd be like, they kicked nope. you out of prison. This whole thing's going to crumble. Only church gear would take you. Only church gear would take me. <laughs> church gear and Jesus Christ. That's the only people taking Blake Hodges. Um, and that's now my favorite moment of this podcast. Okay. Is the fact that only church gear would take Blake. Well, my favorite moment of the podcast is when I get to give our listeners 11% off at churchgear.com with code podcast. Uh, Didn't I cancel that code? You better use that code before Toby cancels it. But thankfully, he doesn't know how to work the back end of the website. That's a That's 100% true. 